Esper Control. His opponent, Alan Bastion, is playing an Esper mid-range deck, although this is much more of a, an Esper humans derivative, you would say? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's it's very white-based using creatures like Precinct Captain, Brimaz, Obsidat, Soldier of the Pantheon, Archangel of Thune. Uh, the, the blue and black splashes are primarily for support cards like Hero's Downfall and Detention Sphere, but uh, he also has Afara, God of the Polis. As you see, Alan lead off here with a Basic Planes and a Soldier of the Pantheon. This deck actually reminds me quite a bit of the black-white deck that, uh, that Paul Rietzel and I played at the last PT. It's basically just the same concept, but with a far instead of Desecration Demon and uh, de Detention Sphere. Hollow Fountain tap for Allen and Soldier of Pantheon across for two. No follow-up play. And Jensen with a Temple of Enlightenment. Godless Shrine untapped for Allen. And here is Brimaz. Soldier of Pantheon across for two. Knocking Jensen down to 16. Brimaz, a card that got a lot of hype on spoiler season, hasn't quite lived up to it yet in standard. I mean, it, at least it has the right numbers for uh, beating Bile Blight. Um, the big challenge has been that Mizzy and Mortars has surged in popularity, but the uh, the Sphere of Heliod we see coming down is partly a response to that, you know? Once yep. your Brumaz is up to a 4-5. So Jensen plays a Hollow Fountain untapped, his third mana, and passes the turn with no play, representing Dissolve, which he'll use here on Spear of Heliod. And Jensen mulling over his scry. I mean, obviously what he wants is a Supreme Verdict, but anything that deals with Brumaz would at least get things stabilized. A Detention Sphere, uh, yeah, even Doom Jace Blade. would do a little bit of work. So Brumaz triggers, makes a token, and Allen across for five points of damage. Uh, six even. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, this is quite the. Uh, this is this is exactly how Allen wants to be opening. Yep. Now Jensen did keep a card on top from his scry, which means we're probably going to see. Yep. The, ten, the Supreme Verdict. Basic Planes and Supreme Verdict here for, for William to clear up the board. Alan remembers the Soldier of Pantheon trigger. Nice. Very impressive. That's a, that's something I call, you know, the... Uh, it, it's like being a Major League Baseball player. If you remember 30% of the time, you're doing really good. <laughs> Another Brumaz from Alan. A temple from William. Scries to the bottom. And simply passes the turn. Vermaz into the red zone and hit with an Azorius charm after the trigger. However, another Vermaz to follow it up. Yeah. And Vermaz, not a card that you imagine doing a lot of leg work against a deck like Esper, but it's still the raw power you can see. It's here. Oh, I mean, definitely. But part of what makes the uh, the Vermaz so good in this matchup compared to uh, how it would be in most other decks is that he has so many big threats, each of which needs to be answered. And so you end up in the spot where it's like, okay, Brumaz, you have to deal with this or I'll win the game. Then, you know, another big threat, whether it's Obsidat, Archangel, uh, even Precinct Captain. Yeah, he has a lot of threats in his deck that definitely require fast responses. Uh, he's Jensen here really mulling over this play. I saw Elspeth in hand. Don't know if he has the corresponding six mana. Now, I, I think what he might be thinking about is whether or not to Sphinx's Revelation tapping out on his main phase, just in case he draws a tap land, because he desperately needs to hit that uh, Elspeth. Ah, so he does have the land, and so we're going to see the Elspeth. He, follow, he falls to five here to play Howl Found Untapped, plays Elspeth Sun's Champion, and pluses it to make three tokens. Uh, again, attacking with Brumaz and his token, triggering and making another token. This is a real hard spot for Alan to climb out of now. You know, this ha I mean, this has all swung very quickly. He has Hero's Downfall and Detention Sphere type cards in his deck, but nothing like that available to him right now. And his hand is full of cards he can't cast because uh, two of them are more Brumazes and one is a five drop. 
And Allen does not add another Brumaz to his board and simply passes the turn with the one that he has in play. Yeah, the, uh, the legendary drawback definitely coming back to yep. haunt him here. Fortunately, the, uh, the ability to drop the Archangel next turn will be, you know, at least present a possible way to get out of this. But Elspeth's so good against just random creatures. Definitely. Unfortunately, Alan draws another five drop, does not have the fifth land. And we are seeing things slip away very, very quickly. We're getting to the point where not even a, you know, a land isn't going to help him. The five drops are too slow at this point. And here's an end of turn revelations for Jensen for three. And if you've ever played against Blue White or Esper, you get the feeling that this is where Jensen's about to shift gears and start taking, really taking this game over. Yeah, and as we see now, he's got an Elspeth that has the board completely under control and a Counterspell in hand. Not even a top deck Heroes Downfall or Detention Sphere can, uh, can turn this one around. So Jensen again, plussing Elspeth. Four tokens in play. Detention Sphere, the draw for Allen. Perhaps too little, too late. Yeah, he needed this any turn before now. But this is what that Esper Control deck does, you know? It, it, it slows things down a little bit. It tries to not die for a little while. It puts down something that's going to make it so it actually is gaining some kind of an advantage. But then as soon as it Sphinx's Revelations, then it, you know, it takes the driver's seat. So, Alan attacks with his Bermaz there. Jensen throws all four tokens in front to get Bermaz off the table, leaving him with one soldier. And now Jensen gets untapped with a boatload of mana, Elspeth at six, and a lot of cards in hand. And now he's on the offensive, attacking with his soldier token. Yeah, he's going to have three more soldiers to defend himself, so... The, the free beats are the best. Just pluses Elspeth yet again. Alan draws an Elspeth of his own, but with only four mana in play, will offer very little help. And now Jensen with an end of turn, rev for six. This has been a very surgical game, it feels like, from Jensen. Took his lumps, but now firmly in command. Yeah, I mean, things were looking a lot rougher early on. Um, but I think what might have ended, uh, you know, the, I think the real deciding point was when, uh, when Jensen countered the Spear of Heliod, <laughs> that... Uh, if he would have still had that spear in his hand for a later turn, like uh, when, when Jensen, you know, for instance, the turn where he did nothing because his hand was full of legends, mm -hmm. it may have been able to uh, help him offer a little bit more resistance. So that is one of the risks of playing a deck with this many five and six drops and still have an aggro opening with no card draw. Sometimes you just don't get up to five in time. So Thought Seeds from Jensen takes Archangel Thune. And now... Jensen with just a boatload of tools, just going about ending the game as quickly as possible. Makes an Elspeth emblem, detention sphere is the Brimaz, and sends across for, for 12 points of damage. Yeah, he knows that nothing going on last turn was relevant, and he has a counterspell in hand in case Allen draws anything relevant this turn. Precinct captain the draw from Allen, and now all we're waiting for is the concession. And there it is. Thanks, it in. So, yeah, that's an, uh, going back a little bit to what you were talking about uh, with that third turn of the game. When Jensen plays the Hallowed Found untap and passes the turn, do you think there's an argument for just not playing anything at all? When Alan has a Bermaz in play, he, you know, he kind of has a board, he has a Soldier Pantheon. Is the risk of that card being dissolved there, maybe the Scribe really matters, or maybe you really need that Spear later on. Is there an argument there for Alan to just cast nothing at all? Yeah, I think that, I think that the, I mean, first of all, the two damage was very, like, a very real cost there. You're yes. not going to just pay two life to bluff the vast majority of the time. And even if he was bluffing, the, uh, the, he only prevented one damage compared to having the spear down, whereas the spear represents such a powerful threat at any other point. So, I, but it's, it's not clear with it, that he could have turned it around without having that fifth land. Either way, though, that was definitely the key dis, you know, decision point. Yeah. And I think it was really good on, uh, it was obviously an excellent play on Jensen's part, paying the two life, deciding, you know, even though this is going to give information, I got to just run it. This is the best chance I have of, uh, you know, just run out the, the untapped land. Yeah, so moving on to the sideboard here, Jensen has one ultimate price, a faded retribution, two gainsay, a negate, two hero, heroes downfall, three copies of Blood Baron of Viscopa, an Archangel of Thune, two Dewblades, and two Thought Seizes. 
I think nearly all of the cards in the sideboard are live, potentially. The additional Definitely. spot removal is very valuable. Uh, Alan's black, base black white deck is probably quite susceptible to Blood Baron. Uh, Definitely. The additional counter spells, once you see all those extra threats, uh, those expensive threats, rather, I mean, and even Gainsay is theoretically live. I mean, he, you know, Alan has blue cards, including Detention Sphere. I think here that I would want the additional removal spells, the Blood Barons, and probably the extra Thought Seasons as well, because Alan's likely going to be sideboarding into, you know, bigger, more durable, more cumbersome threats. I think the real question just ends up being how much does Jensen have to take out? Because, as you said, basically all 15 of these cards could come in if he wanted, but he has too many great options, so he's going to have to bench things like Gainsay and Negate at the very least. Mm -hmm. He's going to want things like Hero's Downfall, Doom Blade, Ultimate Price, Blood Baron, uh, and so on. I think the question is, out of things like Thoughtseize, Faded Retribution, Archangel of Thune, it's just a question of how many of the main deck cards uh, are worse than those. Things like Syncopate, Azorius Charm, uh, perhaps some number of, of Planeswalkers, um, more likely, though, I think, he, I think he might end up having to decide, am I going to be playing with a little bit of permission or a little bit of discard? Because he, I don't think he can afford to play with very much of, of both. Yeah, and it's possible this is something that gets swapped whether or not he's on the play or on the draw. Because the counter spells, particularly Syncopate, so much better when you're on the play. Uh, and the discard spells are a lot more reliable when you're on the draw. So there's, po there's some wiggle room for maybe that kind of swap, too. Yeah, definitely. And I think that given the texture of that first game, where we saw Alan never drop below three cards in hand, but tapping, you know, only casting one spell each turn. Mm -hmm. I think those are signs that Jensen might uh, might slightly favor having a little bit of permission, just for the tempo that it provides to to waste Alan's entire turn. And on Alan's side, he has an Aetherling, two Blood Barons of Viscopa, an Erebos, God of the Dead, a Heliod, God of the Sun, two Bile Blights, two Clare of Heresies, two Supreme Verdicts, two Revoke Existence, and two copies of Thoughtseize. So I, I would imagine that the gods here are, are for slower matchups alongside the two copies of Thoughtseize. Maybe Blood Baron as well. There's going to be some times where, uh, of course, the Esper deck is, you know, has Supreme Verdict, has Counter Spells, but there are spots where Blood Baron is actually a tough card for them to answer. Uh, but I do fear, in a structural sense, trying to be too slow because the slower game favors Jensen so much. Yeah, the nice thing, though, is that he has a bunch of easy cuts. Unlike Jensen, uh, Alan has a lot of suboptimal cards game one that are a little bit slower that he can take out. You know, swapping your Archangel of Thunes for, for Blood Barons is just a straight up big upgrade, you know, uh, for this matchup. And trimming things like a little bit of your a little bit of your spot removal in exchange for things like Thoughtseize is another just real clear win. And uh, things like Imposing Sovereign, I mean, he doesn't have a ton of early plays, but Imposing Sovereign is just so bad in this matchup, whereas having access to gods for much more, you know, Erebos and Heliod for much more durable, stronger threats uh, is, is a pretty big upgrade. What I wonder is, is he going to consider the Glare of Heresy? Because it's not always at its best versus these control decks, but they do play, they all play four detention spheres, some number of them sideboard creatures some amount of the time, and most importantly, that game he was traumatized by the Elspeth. Does yes. he want to have the Miser's answers to Elspeth? Yeah, I'm interested. And I, I'm interested in your point on Imposing Sovereign. I played a lot of, you know, Boros, and I played the Orzov aggro deck at the uh, Invitational in Las Vegas in December. I actually liked Imposing Sovereign okay in this matchup because it does provide you some, to, or rather, when I was playing those very aggressive white strategies, because it provides some utility against Blood Baron and Elspeth, which are Esper and Blue White's best cards against you. Now, I don't know if Alan has enough pressure in his deck to really make that a game plan where, you know, he he's forcing the issue and threatening lethal on turn five and Imposing Sovereign is a piece of that puzzle. Uh, but when I was playing very aggressive white-based strategies, I actually liked the card fine in this kind of matchup. Oh, yeah, definitely. The Imposing Sovereign's uh, value against control is largely just dependent on how much do you appreciate, you know, an extra twiddle, like uh, one, removing right. one extra blocker one time. All right, so Allen with a mulligan leads off with the temple, as does Jensen. Oh, it's interesting. So we see one more card from Allen that we hadn't discussed yet, which is Bio Blight. The functionality for Bio Blight, of course, is that it can sweep all the Elspeth tokens. Normally, not super great against Esper, but as we saw that game, he was, uh, you know, he was very traumatized by the whole Elspeth situation. Right. Things were looking kind of okay for him, and then Elspeth took the game over. Oh, yeah. I mean, if he would have drawn a Bile Boy, he could have been in a winning position that game, killing all the tokens and then attacking to kill Elspeth. Right. So Alan has kept it an Imposing Sovereign, cast it on his third turn alongside his third temple. 
Oh, is that bio? Maybe that's Erebos. No, it's both Erebos and Bio Blight. Yeah. So imposing Sovereign beginning the beatdown. Just a planes untapped from Jensen and passes the turn back. Now, what do you think you lead here? There's the spear and the god. Jensen's got dissolve mana up. And there's, ah, he, he goes straight to the throat with Bramaz. So this sets him up potentially, if this forces Jensen to untap in Supreme Verdict, then he could potentially land one of his gods. Definitely. So we'll Which see I if think that's is what we're going to see. Right, so we see exactly this. Uh, Jensen decides not to dissolve Bramaz, rather just untaps, plays Hollow Found untap, plays Supreme Verdict, and now Alan has an opening to resolve a god. And we see Erebos, God of the Dead, show up for Alan. Now, Jensen does have many answers to this, or at least many detention spheres, which we are likely going to see here. But now this is putting him on the back foot because he has this dissolve in hand that he can't do as he keeps spending all of his mana every turn dealing with threats. So Chase ah. Archetype of Thought for Jensen, he'll minus. I don't believe he had a land in his hand, so likely just digging for mana. The split comes two temples and a Blood Baron. Uh, Jensen quickly scoops up the Snaps lands. it up. And you can see Jensen has brought in the Blood Barons. You see one copy in his hand right now. So Alan untaps, plays Soldier of the Pantheon. Plays Spear of Heliod as well. So chooses not to use Erebos this turn, instead choosing to advance his board. Yeah, Erebos is probably going to be at his best each of the turns where Jensen has mana, giving him a way to get some value without walking into counterspells. <laughs> When Jensen is tapped out is the perfect time to play as much as he can. But Jensen untaps with a boatload of cards in hand. Jason two. Mulling over his options. Can't just stick Blood Baron right now because Soldier of the Pantheon's in a way. Jensen casts Detention Sphere. Targets Erebos. Yeah, Soldier of the Pantheon and Blood Baron do kind of a funny dance. Obviously, the Blood Baron can't block the Soldier of the Pantheon, and the Soldier of the Pantheon can't block the Blood Baron. So yeah. we end up in the spot where, you know, Jensen wants to kind of just ride this, J uh, ride this Jace and make sure that Alan doesn't gain an advantage from anything else. So Alan untaps, and he's sided into a pretty slow and reactive deck here. He has Bioblade, Elspeth, and Detention Sphere in hand. So Soldier of Pantheon comes across, knocks Jace down to one loyalty. Which is definitely quite good that uh, that Spear is allowing him to make a little more progress than he otherwise would. And a turn ultimate price from Jensen on the Soldier. Now on taps and Allen with uh, nothing in play besides a Spear and some lands. What do you think about the mixture of Doom Blades and ultimate prices these days? Like, which way is the scales uh, are the scales balanced? I think it's it's marginally better to be having uh, Doom Blades in your deck. Although the thing is, they're often interchangeable, and uh, they're often interchangeable, but Ultimate Price is so much worse against Mono Blue Devotion, but Doom Blade is uh, sort of worse in a lot of other different spots. So I, it has a lot to do with what you how much Mono Blue you think is going to be in the tournament, basically. Jensen minusing the, else, uh, the chase one last time. Again, looking at Detention Sphere versus Lands. And I think you're seeing some of the risk here of trying to side into a slower, more reactive strategy against a deck like Esper Control. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, you can't play a better slow game than an Esper deck uh, with your Esper. I mean, it's like they're both trying to play a slow Esper game and one of them has counter spells and Sphinx's Revelation. Yeah. So Jensen lands Blood Baron with three mana untapped. Alan draws his sixth land. A Water Grave, he plays untapped and attempts to resolve Elspeth and this looks like a syncopate for one from Jensen. Yeah, I think this was Alan's last great big hope. Now Jensen untaps again. Blood Baron in play, dissolve in hand. And firmly in control. We see another copy of Jace Architect of Thought from Jensen. Quickly minuses it, reveals two Temple of Enlightenments and Supreme Verdict. 
Allen again splits land spells. Jensen takes the supreme verdict. At this point, he just wants to have all his bases covered. Yep. You know, as many contingency plans as possible. Plays a temple and scribes to the bottom, and now Blood Baron comes across. And I see this a lot, you know, uh, people trying to side into mixtures of powerful threats and maybe additional counter spells, maybe a lot of discard. But it's very hard to beat decks like Blue-White Control and Esper Control in my mind, unless you're applying a lot of pressure, because they're just so much better suited than you are to play that sort of game. Yeah, if you want to beat them going long, you have to stick something like Underworld Connections, you know. Yeah. And even that is so dicey, because they have plenty of answers. So Alan plays a Bermaz. Jensen says, that's fine, that resolves. I think one of the keys is you got a thought season before they cast Sphinx's Revelation. Yeah. Once they, once they Sphinx, it's already too late. All right, Jensen gonna minus his Jace yet again. And even though we haven't actually seen Revelations proper this game, Jace has served a very similar role. Yeah, this is four cards from this Jace and the previous Jace. Or the option to take up to four cards, rather. Yeah, I mean, it keeps looking like Jensen is effectively looking at four cards at each turn. You know, his draw phase and then his choice of the top three. Jensen with a second copy of Blood Baron. Just testing the water to see if it resolves before he attacks, which it does. Now the, the first Blood Baron comes across. And Alan with... A white piece of removal and a black piece of removal, not providing a lot of utility against these Blood Barons. Yeah. It is, it is real tough to have the reactive cards. Huh. Well, Alan has drawn and cast uh, Supreme Verdict, so he has brought those in apparently and has a little bit more time, but uh, still in a ton of trouble. And that's the problem. Even when you get them like this, how much have you really done? Yep. Like, it was great that he was able to trade his Brumaz and Supreme Verdict for two Blood Barons, but it's not going to change the, the state of affairs. I mean, Jensen can just drop another big threat. And he has right here an Elspeth Sun's Champion, which he quickly pluses. I believe that is an Obzat drawn for Allen. It is. Allen instead leads with Detention Sphere taking care of Elspeth and now has Bioblade for the token. So again, he's answering things, but he's not making any sort of real forward progress. Yeah, without, uh, without any card draw, he's, uh, he's not really getting anywhere. And Jensen has just drawn Sphinx's Revelation, so... Right. Allen attempts to Bioblade. Jen Jensen's just happy as can be that that he's in a spot to be able to... Uh... So Jensen plays a Revoke Existence to get back his Elspeth and pluses it. And untaps, or passes the turn rather, with a lot of mana left over and swings his Revelation at the ready. Allen attempts to resolve Soldier of the Pantheon. I guess Jensen deciding if he wants to rev in response, but says no. And now Allen attempts to, to land Obsidat, and that's going to be met with Dissolve. Yeah, that is basically the one card Allen could play that would get Jensen to not just Sphinx as hard as he can. Jensen instead would rather just have a, you know, play a little slower and just make sure things don't get, you know, don't get crazy here. So Jensen draws Sphinx's, another Sphinx's Revolution on his turn, plus his Elspeth. And now we're going to see a big main phase revelations. Absolutely. He doesn't even want to take, you know, he doesn't want to take the chance of Alan drawing even a gain, say, in the unlikely yeah. event that he has them. He just wants as many cards as he possibly can. So nine fresh ones for Jensen. Is that good? It's, it's a lot. I mean, in fairness, the cards are sort of on diminishing returns, so that's, a, that's good for Alan, but... <laughs> So 
Jensen made that play on Allen's upkeep. That means that he didn't have to discard, but also prevents him from running into a, a counter spell off the top from Allen, like you just alluded to. Let's see what Jen if Jensen can just sweep up the remains with all of the new cards he's just drawn. Have you seen many of the these human Esper human decks? What uh, what what's their what's their niche? What are they trying? Like who are they trying to attack? Oh, we can we can talk. There's a lot of different things going on with that deck. We can once we're uh, it's too complicated to go in right now <laughs> during the match. I'll tell you what, but uh, yeah, we we can definitely discuss that because they're trying to attack a lot of different stuff. So Jensen with the supreme verdict, plus his Elspeth again passes the turn, discarding a couple lands. Allen draws a land and simply passes back. Another rev from Jensen. It feels like the biggest threat for Jensen losing the game at this point is somehow accidentally decking himself. Yeah, I like the modest Sphinx's revelation. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't need all of my mana. I can just, you know, I can afford to only draw six here. I don't need the full nine or what have you. So Jensen does not immediately make an album. He, emblem. He's aware of the presence of removal in Allen's deck and is willing to wait one more turn. So simply pluses his Elspeth up to eight, makes three more tokens, does some more discarding, and passes the turn back. Allen plays a watery grave and says go. We see the emblem from from Elspeth coming across and a lethal attack. And there's a concession. William Jensen, two games to, go, uh, to zero against Alan Basham playing Esper mid-range, a very straightforward and surgical win for Jensen. Yeah, I mean, it, that was basically just the textbook, the textbook Esper plan. Play a few reactive cards, you know, pick his spots. What do you dissolve? What do you use Supreme Verdict? What do you detention sphere? And then get ahead through card draw. And as, as always, Jason Sphinx's revelation being the key to that with uh, Elspeth finishing the job relatively trivially. I mean, it could have been a lot of things, but Elspeth is just reliable in terms of it offers the most other dimensions and is the hardest to get rid of. Yeah. And I'm just, you know, I, I see these kind of games play out a lot on camera where someone is going, you know, they're, they're playing against a deck like Blue White or Esper Control. They move into a lot of God.